Hi there, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. This is Left Side of the Aisle, and I'm Larry Erickson, your host, who for the next nearly half hour is going to be ranting away at some stuff that uh, I think is worthy of your attention. Any reactions to the show can be sent to me directly. My personal email is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and um, you can leave a comment there if you'd like, or you can get the email address from there if you missed it. The one thing I ask is that if you do send me email to please include something in the subject line that makes it clear this is about the show and not spam and um, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm terrible at answering email like I always say. Any event, okay, at, right at the top, some good news. I always like to start that way. Last week, I said that indications were that the Obama administration was going to reject the Keystone XL pipeline, the one intended to carry tar sands uh, from Alberta, Canada to refineries in Texas. Well, the day after I did the show, that's what happened. The State Department, involved here because the project would have crossed an international boundary, uh, announced that it was refusing to allow TransCanada, the which is the company behind the pipeline, refusing to allow TransCanada permission to proceed. The department's press release gave five reasons for rejecting the pipeline, among them a neg negligible impact on our energy security, a marginal contribution to the economy, uh, concerns about local communities, water supplies, and heritage sites, and the nature of what would be transported in the pipeline. But Secretary of State John Kerry, in whose name the release was issued, said in that release that, quoting him, the critical factor in my determination was this, moving forward with this project would significantly undermine our ability to continue leading the world in combating climate change. Now, it's questionable if the U.S. is actually leading the world in, in uh, the fight against climate change, considering its own promises to reduce its greenhouse gases fall short of those of a number of other nations. But still to hear that the potential impact on the project on climate change, uh, to hear that that was the critical factor in the decision, that was good to hear. Now, as always seems to be true, uh, this is not the end of the issue. Canada is already shipping about 3 million barrels of some kind of oil a day to the United States through 31 existing pipelines, and about half of that is heavy bitumen, which is tar sands. But without the Keystone XL pipeline to make it more price competitive, uh, more of those tar sands are likely to stay in the ground. And at least with regard to global warming, that not the pipeline itself, that was the issue. Keep it in the ground. Another thing here is that, I, as I also noted last week, the project may not be completely dead. TransCanada is said to be exploring its options, including starting all over again with the new and hopefully friendlier administration in January 2017, uh, pushing Congress to overturn uh, the, uh, the, uh, the decision, or even filing suit under NAFTA, which would involve asking a business-oriented tribunal uh, to demand that the U.S. either approve the pipeline or um, compensate TransCanada for lost potential profits. However, newly elected Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is unlikely to back a NAFTA challenge. The U.S. has actually never lost uh, a challenge before a NAFTA tribunal, and the legislative route has already been tried and failed. So trying again, starting from scratch under a new administration, would seem to be the only realistic option for TransCanada. But even with a favorably disposed White House, the project would still face extensive and hardened local opposition all along the route. So pursuing the Keystone XL pipeline may well appear to the company to be a case of throwing good money after bad. TransCanada ultimately seems more likely to me to lick its wounds uh, right off this as a bad investment and look elsewhere. So while I don't feel I can be as definitive as Michael Brune, who's the executive director of the Sierra Club, I don't feel I can be as definitive as he was in simply declaring the pipeline dead and won't happen. I do think we can actually be pretty, pretty, pretty darn confident that this is the end of the line for the Keystone XL pipeline and a victory for people, power, and the environment. And that is good news.
All right, now for one of our regular features. It's the Clown Award, given as always for meritorious stupidity. Again, this week we have a repeat amuser or offender, if you prefer. Uh, in this case, it is the man who has got to be the stupidest person in the U.S. Congress. Texas, where else? Congressman Louis Gohmert, the man who puts the Gomer in Gohmert. He recently gave a speech to students at Liberty University, an ostensibly Christian school in Lynchburg, Virginia, which was founded by Jerry Falwell. In the course of his speech, he continued his increasingly lonely crusade against same-sex marriage, something which he once compared to bestiality. He cited the Bible in this, of course, but then took what he said was a totally secular approach, which should convince even those who don't believe in God that homosexuality is unnatural. He proposed an experiment because, I'm quoting him now, Congress is good about having studies. How about if we take four heterosexual couples and put them on an island where they have everything they need to live and exist, and we take four couples of just men and put them on an island where they have all they need to survive, and let's take four couples of just women, put them on an island, and then let's come back in a hundred years to see which one nature favors. Now, I could spend a minute explaining why this inanity isn't even a proper experiment, but that would mean taking seriously, even for that time, a man who has claimed that opponents of same-sex marriage face the same level of persecution as Jews did in Nazi Germany who put forth a terror babies idea where terrorists are coming to the United States in order to have their kid born here and be a citizen so they could be trained to be a terrorist to commit acts of terror decades later. And he supported a pipeline through Alaska because he said if, that, if the existing flow of warm oil through that pipeline ever stopped, it would be harmful to the sex lives of caribou. So instead of all that, I'll note that in quoting the Bible on marriage, he mentioned that Jesus, uh, Jesus said, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So now, when someone can show me all the times Gomer condemned and railed against all of his conservative colleagues who have had affairs, gotten divorced, sometimes multiple times, or both, on the grounds that they were defying God's law, then it might, might be possible to chalk up his dueling antipathy to same-sex marriage as an outgrowth of, his, of his, his extremist fundamentalism rather than out of plain old bigotry against homosexuals where the Bible serves as the excuse, not as the cause. Frankly, I do not expect that to happen. Which is why Louis the Gomer Gomert, the stupidest person in Congress, is and will always remain a clown. Okay, now for our other regular feature. This is the outrage of the week. And the source of the outra outrage this week is something that has been the source of too much outrage over the time we've been doing this show, the United States Supreme Court. Let's run down some basic facts. On March 23, 2010, Israel Leja led Texas police on an 18-minute chase at speeds up to 110 miles an hour after cops tried to serve him with an arrest warrant. Now, clearly police had good cause to stop Leja, so they laid down road spikes at three locations he was expected to pass. But at one location, underneath an overpass, State Trooper Chadron Molino showed up Having heard about events on his police radio, of course, when it developed that Leja was coming that way, Molino decided on his own strategy. He went up onto the overpass with a high-powered rifle intending to shoot the car's engine block. He got into shooting position and he waited. As Leja's car approached three minutes later, Molino fired six times. He didn't hit the engine once. He did hit Leja four times, killing him. Okay, here's some necessary fill to those bare bones. Molino had not only had no training in shooting at a moving vehicle, he'd never even seen it done. Molino had asked a superior officer per for permission to proceed with his plan, but was told to stand by and see if the spikes worked first. Molino claims he never heard that message, but even if that's true, what it means is he asked for permission and then went off on his own without ever waiting for an answer. 
The claim that he was doing this to protect fellow officers is belied by, belied by facts. One, the officers involved in laying the spikes did have training on how to minimize risks to themselves from the car hitting the spikes. Um, none of them had expressed any concern for their safety, both of which things Molino would know. And the time gained uh, when Molino shot Leja uh, between then and the time the car hit the spikes was less than three quarters of a second. And after the shooting, Molino's first words to his superior were, how's that for proactive? Which something is apparently had been an issue in an evaluation. Leja's family sued Molino, claiming he had violated Leja's Fourth Amendment rights by his use of excessive force. Molino claimed what's known as qualified immunity, under which cops and other government agencies, uh, agents rather, can't, can't be held personally liable uh, for their actions unless their conduct violates clearly established statutory or constitutional rights. The trial judge here denied the claim, saying the case could go to the jury. The, a panel of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld that decision. Upon rehearing, the full court of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the decision. On November 9th, the Supreme Court overturned it, basically letting Molino off the hook. They actually said in a decision that cops are immune from such lawsuits unless it is, and this is a quote, beyond debate that a shooting was unjustified and clearly unreasonable. Now, beyond debate, that is a standard higher than required to get a murder conviction in a criminal trial. But it is apparently what this Supreme Court thinks is a reasonable standard in order to hold a cop liable for killing someone. What wrenches my gut even more is that the decision here was eight to one. Yes, Stephen Breyer is with the majority. Yes, Elena Kagan was with the majority. Yes, the latest liberal hero, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was with the majority. The dissent, and it was a blistering one, came from Sonia Sotomayor. She lambasted the majority for both reframing the issues and describing the facts in the ways most favorable to Molyneux, even when that meant ignoring precedent. Her conclusion here deserves recognition. Referring to Molyneux's proactive crack, she said that doesn't affect the legal reasoning, but, quoting her now, the comment seems to me revealing of the culture this court's decision supports when it calls it reasonable, or even reasonably reasonable, to use deadly force for no discernible gain and over a supervisor's express order to stand by. By sanctioning a shoot-first, think-later approach to policing, the court renders the protection of the Fourth Amendment hollow. For my part, at this point, I can't see why we don't just issue cops double O badge numbers and be done with it. This is truly a moral outrage, and we need a break. And here we are back. Uh, I'm going to start actually with a quick hero award, which is something we give out here occasionally, to somebody who just does the right thing on a matter big or small. Our hero this time is a young one. is 11-year-old Will Smith of Long Island City, New York. Will is a devoted fan of the New York Mets and particularly a fan of infielder Daniel Murphy. Now, personally, I'm not a fan of Murphy, not after he declared last March that he is 100% against the homosexual lifestyle, but that's neither here nor there right now. What is here and there right now is that Will used $175 of his own birthday money to buy a signed Daniel Murphy bat from Topps. When he ordered it, the bat was in stock online, and it was even, he was even promised a delivery date. But in the postseason, Murphy got real hot. He broke a record by hitting home runs in six consecutive playoffs games, set of Mets franchise records, uh, record rather for home runs in a uh, in the postseason, and become, became the only second person in baseball history, Lou Gehrig being the other, to have a hit, a run, and an RBI in seven consecutive postseason games. Suddenly, the bat was unavailable. Topps canceled the order, claiming it had run out of bats, and said it was processing a refund. 
Will's father, suspecting as I did and do that Topps intended to raise the price of the bat because of Murphy's increased profile, told the story to the New York Daily News, which published it. And guess what? Presto, the bat was not out of stock. Not only did Topps have a bat to send to Will, it also sent the refund. Okay, so it's a cute story of a corporation getting shamed by some bad publicity into doing what it should have done in the first place. So, why is Will a hero? Because he took the $175 refund and he donated it to the Jackie Robinson Foundation, a national nonprofit organization which gives scholarships to minority youths for higher education. Maybe this will serve to remind Tops that there are more important things than its bottom line. And in any event, in my eyes, it makes Will Smith a hero. All right, on a serious thing about heroes, um, the week this show is on is the week after Veterans Day. So I'm going to take this time to do, include my annual Veterans Day commentary. I've done some version of this either on my blog or here on the show for, I think, seven years now. I've pretty much given up worrying about how it will be taken. Uh, I tried various ways to start it, uh, wanting to make sure that I said what I meant and only what I meant, but I've come to accept that there is no way it will not be misunderstood, either accidentally or by some deliberately. Uh, so I gave up trying and just, just say what I have to say. I regarded this as at least a useful counterpoint to the annual hyped praise of all things veteran, which too easily slides over to praise of all things military. The thing is, November 11th has become so well known as Veterans Day that most people don't remember that originally it was called Armistice Day. It was intended to commemorate those who died in World War I by an observation of the end of that war, which ended at least on the Western Front at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. But after World War II, the U.S. changed it to Veterans Day, and over time it's become not a commemoration of those who died in war and of peace, but a celebration of anyone who's ever been in the military. Now this actually arose, what actually prompted this the very first time I did it, was that I was, and in fact that I still am, deeply disturbed by the increasing tendency among progressives to adulate all things military, and the commentary was aimed specifically at them. And I was particularly disturbed by the practice of routinely referring to soldiers as our heroes, or some similar formulation, which I maintain and still maintain was being done to be our way into the national security debate, the way to prove that we were as pro-military as the right wing and that we were as tough and as ready to do what was necessary as any right winger. Now this attitude about the heroes still exists. Do a Google search on Soldiers Are Heroes and you will come up with something over 14 million hits. So let me be clear here about what I'm saying. Soldiers are not heroes. A hero is by definition someone who is in some way extraordinary, remarkable, worthy of emulation. It is at best a risky business to, de to define someone as extraordinary simply by the virtue of wearing a uniform. But that's exactly what's happened. Um, so instead of being, again, a commemoration of the dead and of peace. November 11th has become a celebration of all things military, rife with pains to the nobility of sacrifice and to veterans as the true patriots. And apparently they are the only true pa patriots. The rest of us aren't in any way patriotic because they are given due unavailable to the rest of us. This is not only unfortunate, it's potentially dangerous, as it makes it too easy to slip into the militaristic attitude that what soldiers do goes beyond necessary evil, or even just necessary. It goes beyond even honorable to being admirable, to something, something to be emulated, something to be celebrated, an attitude that makes it all too easy to promote additional enlistments, additional weapons, and additional wars. A perhaps revealing example of that attitude uh, came a few, it was a few years ago now. It was during an interview with then senator and liberal hero of the hour Jim Webb uh, on The Daily Show, um, the audience for which both on air and in, and in studio had a well-known lefty tilt. Uh, 
Now, most of that interview was a discussion about Webb's bill to expand veterans' educational benefits, under which, on his bill, in return for three years in the military, soldiers would receive four years' tuition at their best state colleges, plus the cost of books, plus a monthly stipend. At one point, when Webb said that the least we can do for our soldiers is give them a chance for, quote, a first-class future, unquote, the audience burst into loud and spontaneous applause. And I thought then, as I have thought since, would there be any chance, any chance at all, if this, of that same sort of reaction, if the same proposal was made on behalf of any other group? What if someone proposed paying for four years of college for, say, cops? or firefighters? How about uh, volunteers in AmeriCorps VISTA or the Peace Corps? Now people who do those latter two, they do get some educational benefits, but it's nowhere near four fully paid years of college at their best state college. What about, to go beyond this, what about publicly funded continuing education for doctors and nurses? Such continuing education is not only a good idea for the health, health and safety of the public, but it's often a, a requirement for maintaining their licenses to practice. Now, certainly having doctors and nurses up to date on the best knowledge and practice uh, is beneficial to the public, so why not have public financing of such continuing education? Now, it's true that the idea of tuition-free, taxpayer-supported public education up through four years of college for uh, those who are showing themselves capable of uh, meeting the educational requirements, educational standards involved, this idea has entered the political arena, but that doesn't take away from the point being made here. Propose an education, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, propose an educational plan for a first class future for veterans and even progressives cheer wildly while proposing that same thing for anybody else doesn't even chart and proposing it for everyone gets mostly, gee, how can we ever afford it? So why only soldiers? What does it say about us that the idea of paying soldiers' way through college gets ovations, while the idea of anyone else getting the same benefit gets at best quizzical stares, if not outright rejection? What it says is that we regard the work of soldiering as inherently more important, inherently more deserving of praise and reward than the work of others, no matter what contributions they might make to society. And it means we regard the lives of soldiers as inherently more valuable than the lives of anyone else. But if there's only effect of things like veterans' benefits, it might not seem like such a great big, great big deal. Uh, and I say that despite the fact that the money involved is not insignificant, veterans' benefits costing something over $60 billion a year. Uh, and the arguments for veterans' benefits are also often quite misleading. Uh, many of them were instituted at the end of World War II with the avowed purpose that, uh, that those benefits were to make up for what those veterans had lost by being in the military as compared to those who continued in their civilian careers. In other words, the benefits were to ensure that the soldiers did not wind up being penalized for having been soldiers. They were not intended to give soldiers a leg up over everyone else or a first-class future, and they most definitely were not prese presented as being a reward for military service. But that's what, that's what they become over the years, and that's how we continue to treat them. Now, I want to make it abundantly clear here, in case it's willfully ignored, uh, that I'm, what I'm questioning here is not the right of veterans to get any medical care, rehabilitation, and counseling they need as the result of being wounded, either physically or psychologically, and the military's practice of giving such veterans less than honorable discharges precisely to avoid having to provide them with such services is morally reprehensible. But yes, veterans' benefits are too generous to the extent that they become a reward for being in the military. One example being veterans' preferences in civil service jobs. And especially they're too generous when they single out veterans for opportunities such as higher education and housing that are increasingly financially impossible for the rest of us. Put another way, I do not object to any veteran taking advantage of any of the benefits available for them if they're legally entitled to them. That's what they're there for. They're there for you to use. Go for it. But that idea is born of the general principle that I would support the right of anyone in need to get the need that they help 
uh, get the help rather that they need. Put another way, uh, I am opposed to soldiers getting benefits simply for having been soldiers when those benefits are not equally available to others with equal need and equal opportunity for personal advancement. But even so, even again, if veterans' benefits were all there was to it, it might not seem like a great huge deal, but that's not all there is to it. The emotional embrace of soldiers as our heroes, as some sort of disembodied ideal, has implications beyond the immediate ones. They go beyond questions of public support. They go beyond even questions of our recent wars. Because within that embrace, it becomes too easy to absorb, absorb so deeply that one is unaware of it. The idea that a veteran's take on military matters, and by extension all of foreign policy, is inherently more valuable than that of others, not by virtue of, of knowledge or experience or authority or training, but are by simply by virtue of having been a soldier. We regarded it quite correctly as a scandal several years ago when the media outlets uh, using retired generals for commentary were uh, that those generals were actually Pentagon paid, paid and trained PR flacks. But an overlooked uh, uh, fact of here, an overlooked point here, is that the reason retired generals are so prominent as commentators was because their status as military people automatically gave them enhanced credibility in the eyes of viewers and the ears of listeners. In our support of, in our pursuit to support the troops, we have fallen prey to that same attitude, one that regards the statements of war veterans as more valuable, more telling than those of non-veterans. We embrace the militarist, the Pentagon worldview simply because it's the Pentagon. It's become even fairly common to hear dismissive co references to those who never saw combat. Increasingly, this has been used as an all-purpose put-down, even against those uh, or against anyone who have criticized soldiers in any way. As they imagine, it will be directed against me. Uh, I'm a non-veteran and a Vietnam-era draft resistor, where my voice loud enough to attract the attention. But the real danger, the real danger here is that as the attitude persists, it distorts our way of thinking. It drops a, it drops a magnet on our moral compass. I still recall with pain how during the Iraq war uh, we dismissed, we ignored, we downplayed atrocities committed by U.S. forces. We refused to blame the soldiers. We ignored evidence. We ignored the facts. Instead, we brought our, um, our wrath down not on those who committed the atrocities, but on those such as Chelsea Manning who told us about them. But the claims, the charges were dismissed, the arguments were dismissed because you've never been in combat. You don't understand these things happen in war. Yes, they do. And our soldiers were doing them. Our heroes were doing them. Which was and is, even as the deniers seem incapable of realizing at the point. We as a culture, as a society, as a people, wanted to give soldiers a pass for all their personal, all their personal actions, something we supposedly had denied 70 years ago. <sighs> Soldiers are not heroes. They can become heroes, they can be heroes, they can act heroically, they can do heroic things. But the act of, of putting on a uniform and agreeing to put your conscience in a lockbox for the next X number of years does not make your life more valuable than others, it does not make your contributions more valuable than others, it does not make you deserving more, uh, uh, more than others. It does not make you a hero, and we should not fall prey to hero worship. We're out of here. Have the best week you can. Peace.